Um, ethnic identity, therefore, has become a claim-making mechanism. No? Economic, in economic terms, I am Bagobo, therefore I have a right to this land. If you want to, to do something to this land, you have to deal with me. No? And in that sense, identity has also become a commodity. Diba? Not so much in the sense that I can sell it, but that I can trade on it. Diba? If you want to, do, to, to exploit my area, you talk to me. Why? Because I have the appropriate identity for this or that piece of land. No? So I think this struck the state very sharply in the tensions that arose from the push to implement the the Mining Act. The state, I think, uh, from, the, from the reactions from the local communities, the state realized that um, identity has become a uh, asset, no? It's a political asset. And secondly, uh, moving on to a more recent setting in the discussions over the Bangsamoro juridical entity, they, re they have realized that uh, identity has become a political asset. No? It's no longer claiming just the territory or the resources there. It is claiming self-governance. It is, it is claiming, uh, as, uh, again, self-determination. And I'd like to end with a brief run-through of the state's responses, which are initial because the, I think the state is still trying to come up with a clear, uh, still trying to come up with a program of how to deal with the realization that Ethnic identity, indigenous identity, is a political and economic asset. How does it do this? By, on one hand, ex what I call exclosure. No? It encloses the land because it, you know, it encloses it by the process of titling. It privatizes it. But at the same time, what it privatizes excludes its land. Uh, it excludes resources. So there's this process of exclosure. Secondly, the state rewards Cadtis or titles to its collaborators. Oh, diba? Makes it simpler. And finally, it regulates identity, which brings us back to the theme of our uh, discussion today. Uh, by regulation, I mean control. And I think the state is experimenting very seriously with one specific way of controlling identity, and that is to control who can claim identity. No? That is to say, uh, it chooses who is legitimate. No? It engages in a politics of legitimacy and it engages in a politics of authority. No? If you are somehow connected with a group considered subversive, ah, then you are not a legitimate indigenous people's leader. No? If you are not uh, listed in the government list of official datus, then you are not an official datu. No? And that complicates the situation today. No? For, uh, for me, as an indigenous people's rights advocate, napakagulo ng panahon natin ngayon. I do not know who, in a sense, in a very concrete and very painful sense, I, do no, I no longer know who it is I can properly recognize and represent. No? Because, one, on, the, on one hand, the government itself is, is interfering with these processes of uh, self-assertion of identity, and in the second place, because there is this reality of change. No? It's possible that the, some groups will be claiming kingship, well, queenship, why not? No? Cultures can change. Ultimately, we, we need to be open to that. But there is this difficulty right now with trying to come up with uh, a valid response when indigenous peoples, particularly in Bindanao, the non-Moro indigenous peoples, are so uh, disadvantaged by divisions, political divisions, uh, geographic scattering, and differing levels of political analysis. Um, I'll, I will end with a call for more debate. No? I think one of the good sides, as it were, of the confusion or tension over the MJ, uh, the Moro, Bangsamoro juridical entity thing, no? is that it highlighted the need for debate, and so I would uh, welcome no? further debate on this issue. As somebody pointed out, there is nothing more terrifying as watching ignorance in action. No? So let us address that problem by uh, beginning our dialogue. Thank you.
Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Well, uh, thank you very much for inviting us to respond. Uh, I just would like to to beg the indulgence of the, our timekeeper. They say we will respond for five minutes, but maybe I'll, I'll take a little bit more. Uh, I think as indigenous persons, we do have the prerogative to lengthen our response a bit after we heard three academics talking about us. Okay, so, uh, well, uh, first of all, I think uh, uh, this is a very interesting uh, debate because for me, it really, in a certain sense, it makes me sad to see how how, how our colleagues, Marvik, for instance, and Gas, who have been the, the ones who are in the helm of pushing for the Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act, now are sort of, uh, you can sense, uh, uh, a, 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 like, a, a sense of regret that they went into this whole process, no? But I think, uh, as an indigenous person, I haven't been actively involved in the Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act, although I was part of the indigenous movement since the 70s, since the Chico Dam issue, and uh, up to now, where I'm now uh, in the global level, I'm the, permanent, I'm the chair of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. I would like to believe that uh, whatever the shortcomings of IPRA are, I think it still is something that indigenous peoples can use and I can see a lot of indigenous people still using it. Uh, I said I haven't been involved because I, we, uh, as, as a member of the Cordillera People's Alliance in the past, we, we campaigned up to the level of, uh, of the constitution, the amendment, uh, the, the constitutional provision which gave uh, uh, that, that provision which recognizes our rights to our lands, but after that, uh, we didn't. I didn't pursue the, the with the struggle on the Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act. I have been much more involved in pursuing the. Uh, drafting and negotiations around the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And uh, that is a deliberate thing because I believe that uh, the, the, the fight of indigenous peoples is not just, cannot just be limited at the local level or the national level. It really has to be internationalized because many of our issues, I mean, in fact, the uh, Gas said that the state has con uh, uh, made indigenous peoples. I think it's colonialism which has really created indigenous peoples. If we were not colonized, we will all be indigenous peoples, but because we were colonized, there were those who were more assimilated than the others, and therefore, uh, we who had uh, maintained our own pre-colonial pre cultures for more than 350 years, of course, had a, uh, has, have, a, have a difference with the majority of the population who have been dominated, who have been uh, colonized, no, or who, has been, who have been assimilated. So, uh, that's my first point. Secondly, I think the politics of indigenous people struggle is really the politics of uh, identity and human rights. So I really uh, take exception with the points being raised that uh, uh, human rights can be debilitating. I don't think so. I mean, it's debilitating in so far as the state doesn't recognize its obligations and, it's, uh, and, it's, and doesn't comply with everything that, his, that it has signed to under international human rights law and, of course, national human rights law. And I think it's our responsibility as people who have fought for human rights to make to make the state accountable in terms of uh, pay, uh, complying with whatever it has signed on to, and of course because these are already the international human values that are accepted by the world. So it's I mean it doesn't make uh, any sense you know for 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 us to not to really uh, get the state to implement these things. Of course that's ideal. We know that the state doesn't implement it because it has its own interest, but that doesn't mean that we should stop uh, struggling for the implementation of these human rights. Uh, secondly, the, the definition of indigenous peoples. That is really a very sensitive issue. And in fact, at the global arena, we ended up with the declaration not defining who are indigenous peoples, precisely because of the reasons that have been cited earlier. That number one, the moment you define it, especially a global definition, you sort of cast it in stone and you don't recognize the changes that, that they, they, the, the changes that come along uh, with history, of course. Secondly, indigenous Indigenous peoples feel that uh, if, uh, if you define uh, indigenous peoples, then you are also, uh, of course, imposing your own uh, definition, which doesn't necessarily re reflect what indigenous peoples think in terms of what their identities are. No, and therefore, and, and of course, thirdly, in, in international human rights law, peoples or minorities have never been defined. Why is it that suddenly when it comes to indigenous peoples, states are wanting a definition? I mean, if 
if this is not a clear case of discrimination, I don't know what it is, you know. So we, in the end, we agreed that we will not define indigenous people. Self-identification is the primary principle that will uh, lead towards identifying who is uh, indigenous. And, uh, and uh, the definitions or the working definitions that have been developed can be used as a framework, no? So that's, uh, so maybe that's one of the problems that we had here in, in at least in the IPRA, as when uh, Marvik discussed all the different criteria that was there, I can see the weaknesses in the, in the definition that has been put in IPRA, no? But nevertheless, uh, in spite of those weaknesses, I think the fact that, that there is a group of people whose claims, who, who claim that they, are, uh, they have uh, the right to self-determination, who claim that they have collective rights, and who claim that their identities are linked with their ownership or control over the lands, territories, and resources. These are, these is, these are the common elements of how indigenous peoples uh, uh, identify themselves. And uh, I think that's really, that, uh, that kind of framework is something that, that uh, that resonates with a lot of indigenous peoples in the world, no? So, so the the whole issue of uh, definition is problematic, and really we don't like to get stuck with a definition that uh, somehow puts you in a box and doesn't recognize the changes that come along with the development of the world. Uh, thirdly. Uh, there was the point raised about IPRA. After IPRA, even after IPRA, many indigenous peoples are still marginalized. No? I hope this is not saying that it's because of IPRA that more indigenous peoples became marginalized because I think that somehow uh, loses uh, the fact that there are many other reasons on why indigenous peoples are marginalized. And of course, the neoliberal uh, agenda is one of the reasons. No? But secondly, the reason is that uh, the mindset, the dominant mindset, of people in government, of uh, the dominant population, is still very largely discriminatory against indigenous peoples, and, uh, and discriminatory in the sense that they don't recognize the systems of indigenous peoples that they would still like to use to govern themselves and to govern the way they relate with their lands, their territories, and resources. No? Uh, so I think uh, maybe, maybe we should reflect on that a little because, for instance, if you say that, then for instance, what about the women? We cannot say that the women, in, in spite of the women's laws and all that, in the existence of the National Commission on the Role of Filipino Women, we cannot say that the situation of, Indi of women are better now. You know? In fact, we can say because of, the, of globalization, because of the continuing uh, way that the nation state is pursuing development, sending people out of the country, the situation of women has even become worse. But it's not because of the weaknesses also of the law, no? Uh, uh, thirdly, uh, the point about uh, uh, the reconciling the Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act with modern nation state, no? That uh, Gus has raised. I think uh, that the nation, modern nation state building has been a problem. It's one of the main problems of indigenous peoples because when the modern nation states came into being, they decided that we have to have one nation, one culture, one language, and to hell with all the other multicultural and multilingual peoples who don't speak the national language or who don't dance the tinikling. No? And I think that's really, and for most, uh, for, uh, all over the world, that's the main problem that indigenous peoples have raised. We were created be, our problems are rooted in colonialism and secondly in nation state building and the whole process of modernity and that, that really is the problem and now we of course we are seeing the crisis crisis upon crisis whether it's climate change or the financial crisis all these kinds of crises that we meet now are, are really essentially because of the way these states have been shaped in the ideology the, the, the market uh, ideology the, the neoliberal uh, capital's ideology that they keep on insisting the world has to follow and they want the world to follow the model which, has, which is now totally failing even in their own countries 